Welcome everyone to the eMedica Foundation SJT Essentials webinar for Foundation Program Entry 2022. Um, for those that haven't met me before, my name is Mohibur Rahman. I'm a portfolio GP and a consultant in medical education based here in Birmingham and Solihull. Um, I've been teaching around SJTs for a long time. So I wrote the first article on the use of SJTs in medical recruitment in BMJ careers back in 2007, when it was introduced for GP training. We were the first specialty to use it. I also wrote the first article on the use of SJT for students, for the foundation SJT. Um, and we've been teaching about SJTs for GP training and various other specialties that use it as part of something called the MSRA, the Multi-Specialty Recruitment Assessment, since 2007, and teaching specifically to the foundation SJT, which is different since 2012, when it started being used live. And at eMedic, our team has trained over 48,000 delegates now. So I'm going to start with an overview to the SJT. Then we're going to have the longer session is we'll look at tips and techniques for the SJT in terms of the different types of questions. And we'll do at least one sample question of each of the different types. Then I'm going to just touch on some of the core knowledge. We can't actually go and teach that. But what knowledge do you need for the SJT so that you can go away and look at it? Uh, then we've got the Q&A session. And then the last session, useful resources. You know, what might you do after today to help you actually prepare and some final tips? OK, so we will finish at 9.30. Um, we won't be any later than that. All right. So let's start with the SJT Essential. So let's uh, launch a couple of polls and see what you already know or think you know. So first question, what is the true weighting of the SJT and the educational performance measure in your overall FPAS ranking? So options are A, B, and C. So A is 50-50, SJT and EPM for everyone. They're equally weighted. B is you think that the EPM actually carries more weight than the SJT for some students. And C is you think the SJT carries more weight than the EPM for some students. So 50-50, EPM more or SJT more. Okay, so I've put A, B and C. If you don't see the poll, feel free to write into the chat. Okay, so you can see that most people thought that the SJT is equal to the EPM for everyone. This is important for everyone, okay? And then after that, a few people, about 20%, SJT more than the EPM. Very few people thought the EPM is more. So the actual answer is actually C. The SJT carries slightly more weight than the EPM for some students. I'll explain how that works when we get to that section. Let's do another one. How many different subtypes of question are there in the foundation SJT? Okay, so different subtypes. Um, so we've got all the way from two to nine. So A, two, B, three, C4 down to E9. Again, I'll launch a poll for you. Okay, so different subtypes, as in specific different types of SJT. Not how many sections, but specific subtypes of question. A lot of changes happened to the SJT last year that some of you might be aware of. Some of you, though, you might have read some books which uh, maybe aren't up to date and maybe don't talk about some of the newer style questions. Okay, so. I can see that, uh, again, quite a big spread. The two most popular answers are B and C, three and four. The correct answer is actually going to surprise a lot of you. It's E, nine. There are nine distinct subtypes of SJT questions within the foundation SJT now. OK, so there are three sections. Each section has three subtypes. So there's nine different types of questions that you could face. OK, and then the last one, before we actually get into the meat of it, um, approximately what proportion of the marks are from the third section, the final section, which is the ranking type questions, where you rank things from best to worst, okay? So just, again, I'll launch the poll, 25%, 33%, 40%, 50%, 60%. What do you think? What proportion of the marks come from the last section, the ranking type questions? Okay, great. Actually, um, a lot of you have got this one right. Um, so they're actually about 50%, approximately 50% of all the marks actually come from the final section okay so you know although it's one of three sections it's actually really important in that it carries more marks than any other individual section half the marks in the whole paper come from the last section which is why it's so important to manage your time that if you don't manage your time well in the first and second section the section that carries half the marks you actually might have less time to address okay so let's start with an overview of the exam so the sjt exam will have 75 scenarios However, it's likely that there'll be at least 10 or more pilot questions, i.e. questions that don't carry any marks. They're made up of that 75. They're not on top of that. They won't be labeled any differently. They won't look any different. You won't know which questions carry no marks, 
but there will always be some questions that are there for research purposes that won't attract any marks at all. So you've got to take all 75 scenarios seriously. Now, when I say 75 scenarios, some scenarios have more than one question within it, okay? So there's a lot more than 75 questions. There are 75 scenarios, okay? In terms of the dates, you will get a chance to book either the first block of dates, which are 6th to the 18th of December, or the second block, which are the 17th to the 22nd of January, 2022. And there are multiple equated test forms. So on any given day, not just from day to day. So for example, there might be hundreds of you that sit it on the 6th. Each of you, when you click start, you will automatically be allocated one of multiple different versions of the paper. I.e. the person sitting next to you won't have the same questions as you, okay? The question papers are all equated, i.e. questions are tagged with difficulties. They'll all have the same proportion of types of questions, the same proportion of questions mapped to the different domains. They'll all have the same proportion of easy, medium, and hard, so that we can compare someone that sits it in London to someone that sits it in Nottingham, to someone who that sits it in Glasgow, to someone that sits it in Cardiff, to someone that sits it in Belfast, okay? Um, to someone that sits it remotely from home, and someone that sits it on the first day to someone that sits it on the last day in January. Okay, so they're multiple equated test forms. You're not gonna have the same questions as the person next to you. And you're gonna either sit it at a Pearson View Test Center, there's over 150 in the UK, and there's thousands worldwide, or you might have applied or might apply to sit it online, okay? So in terms of the time for the 75 scenarios, standard timing is two hours and 20 minutes. Those of you that, have extended timing. So for example, someone with dyslexia or um, dyspraxia or an, another form of neurodiversity that has already applied for uh, you know, um, adjustments, if that's accepted and you submit your proof, you get 25% extra time. So you'd have two hours and 55 minutes for the actual exam. There's a bit of time at the beginning where there's like an introduction. There's a bit of time at the end where there's an optional survey, okay? But in terms of the actual exam, and the points are allocated via a competitive ranking algorithm. So what happens is for the SJT part of your ranking, you get somewhere between zero and 50 points, but that 50 points is allotted to three decimal places now. Used to be two, since last year it's three decimal places. Anyone that's in the bottom half a percent of scores out of everyone that sits it, uh, they will be reviewed and they will have to have like a Viva type interview Unless they pass that, they will be withdrawn and won't be able to attend or join the foundation program next year. Okay, they'd have to repeat the following year. That's only the bottom half a percent. And even then, you do have a chance, if you like, to show that you do have the competencies um, and are able to pass that interview, you could still join foundation. But unfortunately, a lot of people that are in this, if they attend that interview, very few actually end up entering foundation. Okay. It's not going to happen to any of you because you're already thinking far ahead by the fact that you're giving up a, an evening to come to something like this and get started thinking about the exam. OK, but just to be aware. So overall, your total score is between not not 200. It's between 34 and 100. So remember, I mentioned to you that the SJT actually carries slightly more weight. Yes, nominally, they're 50 50. Right. But you see, no one gets less than 34 in the EPM. So no one can get zero as a total score. Do you see, the lowest score is 34, the highest score is 100. Of that, 50 of it is the SJT. And then the SJT is to three decimal places. So I'll show you how it can make a difference. So, <clears throat> type into the chat. If you got 80% of all of the available marks from the paper, roughly, what do you think your score would be for the SJT part out of 50.000 to three decimal places? Roughly, okay? Approximately how many marks do you think you'd get out of 50 if you've got 80% of the available marks? So a few people have said 40, so you get 40.00, i.e. you get 80% of the marks, you should get 80% of 50, 40 marks, yeah? The actual reality from the latest data we have available is actually if you were to get 80% of the available marks, you'd only get 35 SJT points, okay? Why is that? because your SJT score isn't about what your actual score is as an absolute number. It's about your score compared to everyone else that sits it. And if you get 80% of the available marks, you would be significantly below the mean. And so you would get a lot less 
than 40 SJT points. This is from the latest available data because last year they still haven't published a technical report. The year before the technical report was published and someone that got 80% of the available marks, they would have only got 35 SJT points, which is quite a low score. Okay, do you see, it's not about your score as an absolute. It's about how do you do compared to others? It's competitive ranking. You're gonna be ranked one to 7,800 based on how you score. Whoever gets the highest score is gonna get basically 50. Whoever gets the lowest score is gonna get near to zero. Okay, so it's not just about an absolute. Okay, that's really important. I think a lot of people are surprised by that. Okay, so let me show you, although they haven't published a technical report, the raw data of how much different candidates scored is available. And I downloaded it and analyzed it uh, a couple of days ago. And so if we look at the proportion last year's data, less than 10%, it's just over 9% of those that were allocated a job scored 44.00 and above. Okay, so if you can be, you know, sort of 44 plus, you're gonna be in the top 10%. That means you've got a very good chance you're gonna get one of your top choices. Okay, and then if we look, you know, about the next 20% or so, or well, between 42 and 43.99 recurring, about a quarter were well, between 40 and 41.999. The mean score was about 40, okay? And then all the way down to about 4% of people that were allocated were between 26 and 33.9. And then you've got people that scored less than 26, they'll be in that bottom half percent. They're the ones that would have to have an interview to have any chance to get in. A lot of them didn't get allocated. A lot of them didn't get into foundation, okay? So do you see that? Again, another reason why the SJT is actually worth slightly more than the EPM for some candidates, that nobody gets less than 34 for the EPM, but several hundred doctors got less than 34 for the SJT, okay? So let me show you why it's so important that you do as well as possible in the SJT, okay? These names are made up just to make it easier to think about a case study, but you know what their achievements would be to reach the EPM are real, and these exact scores are from real candidates. I've just anonymized the names, I've changed the names if you like. So imagine you've got Mary, first decile at UCL, intercalated and got a first for her BSc, and has got two publications. That gives an EPM of 49, that's nearly perfect. Okay, so there was a candidate last year that had 49 EPM points, but only got 30.215. You see, it's to three decimal places, SJT points. I, their total would be 79.215. This is real data from a real candidate. I've just changed the name. Okay, down to Ravi, fifth decile at Manchester, intercalated and got a 2-1. That gives a 42 for EPM, but did slightly better in the SJT. 38.060 is a little bit below the mean, but it's close to the mean. This is significantly below the mean. To Lynn, fourth decile at Cardiff, okay? Didn't do anything extra. Good for you, Lynn. Enjoy medical school. You know, this is the time to have some fun, do some learning, but have some fun. You've got your whole rest of your training and your career where you're gonna have lots more responsibilities, okay? So, you know, still has done well, fourth decile. You know, she's got 40 points, but did slightly better in the SJT, 40.402. Already, did you see, between these candidates, look, the difference between 80.060 and 80.402, less than half a mark, less than half a point, okay? But it makes a difference. All the way down to Sarah, ninth decile at Sheffield, didn't do any extras. So one of the lowest EPM, and again, this is real candidate data. There was someone that had 35 EPM points, but that was actually in the top 10% in the SJT. They scored 46.878. Do you see the difference it makes? Look, if all five of these wanted the same place and there was only one job left in it, Sarah would get first dibs on that place if that's the one she'd ranked first. She's ahead of Peter by less than 0.5 of an SJT point. Do you see, similarly between these two candidates, there's less than 0.5, but it makes a difference, okay? So what I'm saying to you is, look, you might have done really well in your EPM, that's great. It's really important that you do focus on your preparation for the SJT because you don't want to be in this situation where you get a significantly below average SJT and then might not get your first choice area. Equally, if for whatever reason you didn't do as well at, at medical school as you wanted, sometimes people are unwell during exams, you know, something happens, various issues. Look, if you focus and you work hard, 
and you do really well in the SJT, don't give up hope. There's still a chance for you to get your first choice place. Okay, so it's important for everyone to do as well as possible. Okay, so to summarize, look, the SJT scores actually slightly more than the EPM. I know normally they're 50-50. And the number of points you get in the SJT isn't just about your absolute score. It's about your score compared to everyone else that sits the assessment. It's a nationally competitively ranked system. And in fact, it's now internationally because international candidates are considered on an equal standing. There will be increased competition this year, just like last year, there was a lot more than in previous. And that's because last year was the first year that all doctor jobs were on the shortage occupation list so that international graduates could apply on an equal standing with UK graduates just based on scores. But because that was the first year that happened, a lot of doctors perhaps didn't know about it. This year, a lot more people know about the eligibility applications. OK, so I expect it to be slightly more competitive this year than it was last year. A small difference in scores, less than half of an SJT point. That could be one question in the SJT. OK, so a small difference in scores can have a big impact in terms of where you end up. And ultimately, your ranking is going to affect where you get placed for foundation. OK, so I, if we can help you get the best SJT score possible, what I want ultimately is I want to help you get your first choice deanery. OK, as long as you aren't in that bottom half a percent and as long as you don't fail finals, you're going to get a job. That's not the issue. It's just that if you can get a good score and get a good ranking, you can get your first choice job. OK, that's the important thing. All right. OK, great. So let's move on to tips and techniques for the SJT. All right. So first of all, what does the SJT test? Well, let's start with what it doesn't test. It is not a test of clinical knowledge. You don't need any clinical knowledge to do well in the SJT. It's not testing that at all. Of course, you need clinical knowledge to do well in finals. You still got medical finals to pass. Someone that did well in the SJT failed finals, couldn't enter foundation program because they wouldn't graduate. OK, so, you know, we already know your clinical knowledge is going to be tested. You'll have your theoretical finals. You'll have your OSCEs to make sure you've got adequate clinical and communication skills. You can see that's already being assessed. The SJT is testing something else. It's going to test your judgment and your decision making. But within some of the SJT questions, there will be some knowledge of key guidance. So do you know the GMC guidelines? Can you apply it to real world settings? You know, do you have an ethical approach? You understand uh, what the GMC says a good doctor should and shouldn't do in certain circumstances. That does play a part in some cases, OK, in some questions. Ultimately, what it's assessing is your suitability for working as an F1 by testing against the professional attributes for an F1. So there are a set of core competencies that were derived by analyzing F1s, following them around, looking at what tasks and jobs and skills they need, and then talking to other F1s and F2s. What do you value in your teammates? Then talking to registrars and consultants and GPs. What do you value in your juniors? Talking to nursing team and administrative team. What do you value in the teammates that are working in your wards um, or you know, your departments, OK? So there are five core competencies or attributes or domains for F1s. Every single SJT question will be mapped to test at least one of these as a primary domain, and it will often be secondary domains. So commitment to professionalism. So within that, there's lots of subdomains. But part of that, for example, is, you know, being sort of honest in your dealings, knowing you, that it's you know important that you don't abuse your position as a doctor and, and that we have a lot of responsibility, okay? That you're ethical, that you uphold the GMC's good medical practice and code of conduct, okay? Um, that you respect, for example, confidentiality, all right? Coping with pressure, that you know your limits, that you have adequate and appropriate ways to deal with stressful situations. Effective communication, whether that's written, verbal, within different members of the team, with patients, their relatives. Patient focus, that you put the patients safety and their well-being at the heart of what you do, that you have empathy and sensitivity in your approach, working effectively as part of a team. Medicine is a team sport, right? Okay. So there's a whole load of subdomains from each of these. Okay. And then as I mentioned, some questions need a good working knowledge of GMC guidance and how to apply them at the level of a junior doctor. So in terms of question types, there's actually three parts to the paper. So three different sections and each one has a very different approach. But within each section, there are three different subtypes of questions. We'll touch on that later. But if we look at the three parts overall, part one are the ratings questions. This is about 450 marks. So there'll be 18 scenarios. So 18 of the 75 scenarios are in the ratings. But you see, each of these scenarios 
has four to eight subparts or individual questions within it. So this is the section with the most individual stems, if you like, 114 or so stems are in part one. And that's 450 marks. Part two are multiple choice questions where you pick three from eight options that taken together make the most appropriate response. There are 240 marks for this section and there are 20 scenarios, okay? Part three, is the section that's worth the most marks. So these are the ranking. It's also the biggest section in terms of scenarios. So there's 740 marks here. There's 37 scenarios. In each one, you rank five options from best to worst, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at each part. And for each one, I'm gonna show you, like for part one, we'll just go through one scenario with a few different parts. Part two, we'll do one scenario. Part three, we'll do one scenario. And then we'll talk about it, okay? So part one, you'll have a scenario but each scenario will have multiple stems, somewhere between four, that will be the minimum number of stems, and eight is the maximum number of stems, okay? Each question is marked separately, all right? So each stem will ask you to rate things, okay? There's four possible ratings. There's three different types of ratings, though. So I'm just gonna show you one type. I'll tell you about the others. Have a look at this question, and I'm gonna launch a poll very short, okay? So have a quick look at this question. Okay, so I've closed the poll. Um, about just under two thirds of you picked very appropriate. Just under a third picked somewhat appropriate. And then very few people picked the others. Okay, so let's have a quick read through. And I recommend that you do this with the ratings. For the first one, you want to read this really carefully. Why? Because this will stay the same for all of the other stems. All that will change is the bit at the bottom. So you don't need to read this again for the second one. You just have to read this bit. And that will allow you to speed through the sort of rest of the set. So try to picture the scene. So you're F1, you're working in a surgical ward, it's a night shift. So you can imagine often you'll be tired on night shift, but it actually specifically says that you're tired. And while you're cannulating a patient, you're asked to do another job by a nurse. Again, very common, right? You know, busy wards. So someone's just telling you to, you know, letting you know that there's another job. So they've asked you to do something. Now, while you're trying to cap the cannula, bright red blood spurts out and you realize that actually you have put it into the artery rather than the vein and you've caused the patient significant pain all right okay so that's the scenario and then this question is asking you to rate the appropriateness of the following responses to say so responses to say is one of the subtypes of so rating a response and it, this is important because sometimes people could put their own spin on how they might say it it's important that you assume whatever is being said in speech mark is said exactly and that they're said in a polite way so i'm so sorry I've hurt you okay so that's what you're imagining that you've said so you know is that very appropriate somewhat appropriate somewhat inappropriate inappropriate so the correct answer is that this that's very appropriate now some of you might have thought okay while you said sorry you've not fixed the problem and this is really important for ratings each stem you have to consider on its own not as part of will this complete the whole job just this is this on its own very appropriate somewhat appropriate somewhat inappropriate or inappropriate this doesn't have to completely fix the whole problem or resolve it just is this on its own an very appropriate to an inappropriate thing it's very appropriate you're apologizing you're taking responsibility you're highlighting that you're the one that's hurt them you're the one that's made a mistake and you've apologized for it you're taking ownership okay do you see that's part of being professional but it also shows empathy and sensitivity towards the patient think about it from the patient's perspective how would you feel if someone hurt you? You would like that they take ownership and you would like that they apologize and you'd like that they actually acknowledge it's their fault, okay? Right, so the second one, I'm only gonna give you about 15 seconds to think about it and then I'll launch the poll, okay? Here we go.
I'll close the poll then. Okay, so just you don't need to read this now. You just need to read this bit. Okay, so the bit that you're rating is to say it's because the nurse distracted me. Okay, and 90% of you felt that that's inappropriate. Just under 10% that it's somewhat inappropriate. Very few people picked anything else. Okay, so this is inappropriate. And another way to look at inappropriate, you can see, is to think it's very inappropriate. Like, this is how it will be in the exam. But if you want to make it easier for you, imagine that inappropriate means very inappropriate. Okay? This is totally inappropriate, isn't it? it you're not apologizing. You're not taking ownership that you're the one that's made a mistake. In fact, not only are you not doing that, it's one thing not to take ownership yourself. It's a completely even worse thing to blame it on another person, blame it on a colleague. Do you see? This is totally inappropriate. Okay. All right. Let's do the next one again. 15 seconds and then I'll launch the poll. So you have very awkward veins. Okay. That's the next one. Okay. Poll is launched. So now, very interesting. This time, just under 60% picked inappropriate and about 40% picked somewhat inappropriate. And then again, very few people picked any of the other options. Okay. So again, it's these two, but a lot more of you, 40% picked C, somewhat inappropriate. Okay. So you have very awkward veins. Again, you see, not apologizing, not taking ownership, blaming the patient. It doesn't matter how awkward their veins are because you haven't put it in a vein, you've put it in an artery. <laughs> okay. So to say something like this, you see, think about how the patient might feel. The patient might feel that it's their fault, that you're blaming them. You've not taken ownership. You've not apologized. How might the patient, they're in significant pain, and now you're sort of blaming them. Something it might make them even more upset. Okay. The very fact that they're on a surgical ward needing cannulation in the middle of the night suggests that they're really unwell in some way. Because otherwise, that's not the kind of thing you're going to do in the middle of the night. Okay. So this is, again, inappropriate. Now, a little bit of technique I want to bring you on to. This is what I call the rating trap. Be honest, let me know in the chat. Is there anyone that felt reading this, this is really inappropriate, but you thought, you know what, I've just used inappropriate for this one. And so you felt that you had to use one of the other options that, you know, I haven't used this one yet or this one yet, that you thought that you had to choose one that hadn't been used or that, you know, they wouldn't put two inappropriates in a row unless they're trying to get me. Is there anyone that did that? That your first gut was, this is really awful. This sounds really, really inappropriate thing to say to a patient who I've just hurt, but you actually change your mind then, even though your gut was telling you D, you change your mind from D to C. Is anyone that did that? Let me know in the chat. Yeah, quite a few people. Yeah, absolutely. So this is what I call the rating trap. Really important. Each stem in a ratings has to be looked at completely on its own. You're not comparing it to any of the others. You might use one of these options for every option if that's what it fits. Some of them you might not use for any of them, okay? for any of them within that scenario, I mean, you know, for the four, five, six, seven, or eight stems. You've got to just look at it in and of itself. Is this a very inappropriate thing to say? Absolutely. So then that's what you should pick, okay? Go with your gut, okay? Um, let's move on to the last one, all right? Again, I'll give you about 15 seconds and I'll launch it. So this time it's, I'm sorry, this occasionally happens with some patients. Okay, I'll launch the poll for you now. So this one, probably the biggest spread in terms of answers. So all four options have been picked. The most popular is somewhat appropriate, followed by, some, by somewhat inappropriate, followed by very appropriate. Do you see, big spread, okay? Um, so I'm sorry, this occasionally happens with some patients. The correct answer here is this is somewhat inappropriate. Why is this somewhat inappropriate? Well, the reason it's not very inappropriate is at least there's an apology. I'm sorry. So there's a positive there, but overwhelmingly it's more negative than positive. Why? While you've said sorry, you've not said I'm sorry that I have hurt you. You've not taken ownership. You can see it's very passive. This occasionally happens. It's as if it just happened, not that you made a mistake with some patients, again, it, how do you think, think about it from the patient's perspective? 
might a patient feel that maybe it's some factor to do with them, something to do with their body or, you know, the way they were, maybe they weren't holding still, which isn't what you've been told at all. It's because you were distracted that you've made a mistake. And it's a significant mistake. Accidentally cannulating an artery is a significant mistake. It's really, really painful. Okay. It could in some cases lead to a lot of blood loss. This very rarely happens. Okay. To suggest that it just happens to some patients, can you see, it's very passive rather than you can see, I'm sorry that I've caused you pain. I'm sorry I made a mistake. Do you see the difference? Okay. So there's some positive in that you've said, I'm sorry, but there's a lot of negatives here. And so on balance, it's more negative than positive. That's why it's somewhat inappropriate. Now, this is probably the hardest one of the two. Now, those of you where it's somewhat inappropriate and you put somewhat appropriate, you still get partial marks. You only lose one mark. So if you get it fully correct, you'd get four. So you pick somewhat inappropriate, you get four marks. You had somewhat appropriate when it was actually somewhat inappropriate. You just lose one mark. So you'd get three because you're close. Do you see? So it's marked near miss. I.e., If you're close to the right answer, depending how close you are, you'll get partial marks. OK, so this is just one type or one subtype of the ratings questions, i.e. rating the appropriateness of a response to say from very appropriate to inappropriate. The other three types, the other two types to make up the three rather. So some questions you'll be asked to rate the appropriateness of different actions, okay? From very appropriate to inappropriate. And sometimes you'll be asked to rate the importance of different considerations, different things to think about from very important to not at all important. So it's important that you read what is the subtype is it a rate actions, a rate considerations, or rate responses to say type question? Because it might change how you approach it. We're not going to cover examples of each of the others today because I want to move on to the other sections, okay? But at our full day SJT course, we cover examples of every subtype. Okay, so that's section one, 450 marks. Part two is the multiple choice or the selection question. So again, you get a scenario just like part one, but there won't be sort of like um, just one thing to read and then you make a judgment. There will be eight options. So it takes a lot longer to read, okay? And from those eight, you're asked to select three answers that together make the most appropriate combined response, okay? So these, each scenario is one whole question. So I'm gonna give you a bit longer to do this one. I'll give you just over a minute and a half for this question and then I'll launch the pot. Here we go. So popular answers are A, B, C, and G. These are the most popular, but every single answer has been picked by at least, uh, you know, one person. All right. Um, so let's do a read through. Again, you know, you want to read through the scenario, try to picture the scene. All right. So you're an F1 doctor working in general medicine. The son of a patient who was recently discharged, asked to see you privately on the ward. You see, imagine that. You're at work. They send someone who came to visit their relative. Their relative has been discharged, but they've still come onto the ward and they've asked to see you while you're at work. But they said, can I see you, you know, um, 
like in, in, in the doctor's room or in one of the side rooms, i.e. privately, but on the ward. So you're at work, can you see? You're not on your day off, you're not in uh, Tesco shopping. He expresses his gratitude for the care given to his mother. He offers you an envelope with 30 pounds cash in it. Okay, so that's the scenario, so picture that. Now let's have a quick read of the options. Option A, thank him for his gesture, saying it's really kind. You can try and picture that. Option B, tell him to keep his money. This is the important bit for me. You know, as you're reading, try to picture it and think, what could the meaning of that be? Option C, suggest that, why don't you donate the money to the ward? Everyone looked after your mother, not just me. Option D, you know what? Why don't you get chocolates for the ward staff? You know, um, that might be nice. Option E, you take the money so that he doesn't have to go and get the chocolates and you buy chocolates for the ward staff to save him the trouble. Option F, ask him not to tell anyone. Shh. Option G, inform the ward staff about his gratitude. You know, do you remember Mrs. Smith, the lady that was discharged last week? Yeah, uh, her son came in and he was saying how happy he was with the way that she was looked after. I thought you might like to know. Okay. Option H, inform your clinical supervisor about the positive positive feedback you received. Now, do you notice there's an asterisk here? That's on purpose. In the real exam, there are certain words like clinical supervisor will have an asterisk. If you don't know what the, that role is or what it means, within the online exam, there's a glossary and you can click that and it will show you all the different words and what they mean. So for example, clinical supervisor, another word for it is your consultant. Okay, it's the person day to day in charge of your work and of the patients that are on that ward. Okay, so that's what the clinical supervisor is. Right, so those are the options. So let's look at the preferred response. The correct answer is A, C, and G. Okay, now the way that these are marked is that there's 12 marks for each question, and you get four marks for each bit that you got right. So I, if you had all three of these, A, C, and G, you get 12. Let's say you had two of these three. You had A, C, but instead of G, you had H, for example. Well, you'd get four marks for this, four marks for this, nothing for H. So you'd get eight. Let's say you had any one of these, you'd get four. If you didn't have any of A, C, and G, you get zero marks for this question. Okay. So now section two, one of the things that you can do is there might be some options that they show a negative for one of the domains. You might remove that. Okay. And then that might make your job a bit easier. So rather than picking three from eight, if there's one or two that you think, you know what, there's something not quite right, it shows a negative for one of those domains, it might mean that you're picking three from six, for example, that makes it a bit easier, doesn't it? And then the three that you're picking is really important, they have to go together. It's not just picking the three best, it's the three best as one combination. That's really, really important. A lot of people miss this, okay? So let me show you the ones that we haven't picked and perhaps you can suggest in the chat I'll open up the chat. Some of the reasons why you might not pick. So why might you not pick B? What's potentially, quite a lot of people pick B. What's potentially a problem with B? Anyone think? Okay, so um, someone said that it might cause offense. It might seem rude. Uh, you know, telling him might seem a little bit uh, abrupt. They might feel offended. Yeah, absolutely. Look, picture the scene. How often does this happen? You know, like for example, if he came to take his mum home, she's being discharged. And you might have seen you, you know, you might have been the doctor that's uh, around more. As an F1, you're going to be the one that comes and takes blood, puts the cannulas, updates them on what's the plan. You know, the consultant might make the actual plan or the registrar, but you'll be the one that actually probably sees the family a lot more, right? Oh, in, in lots of cases, they'll say, you know, thank you so much. You've been really good. My mom's really been happy with the way that she's been looked after. This guy's gone out of his way to come in on a day that his mom's not there. Does he specifically come to see you? And then look at this, he's got an envelope and he's taken money out to offer it to you. People don't just have envelopes. Like it's, this is clearly pre-planned. Imagine that and then you tell him, keep your money. You see, it might leave a bad taste. He might feel a bit upset. He might feel offended. Again, it might be different if it said, inform him that there's no need for money for you seeing his mother get better, uh, you know, is the best reward. That'd be lovely. And some of you might have read this and thought that, but you've got to look at the actual wording. OK, so can you see it's not that it definitely is, but it could offend him. It could make him feel like you're not grateful. OK, or that you are not thinking about how much effort he's gone out of his way to, to come in. OK, this is very rare. Right. OK, option F is the easiest one to get rid of. If you're not going to do anything wrong, why would you ask him not to tell anyone about it? So option F is the 
other one that's easy to get rid of. There's nothing specifically wrong with D or E or H. It's just that G is better than H, C is better than D, C is better than E. So can anyone suggest why is C better than D or better than E? Well, yeah, great. So for example, if you look at this, he's already on the ward. He's already gone out of his way. You can see, look at D. D saying, look, I'm really glad about your mum, but you know the ward staff would like chocolates. Could you go to the shop, get some chocolates, come back again and drop off chocolates? You see, D is asking him to go even further out of his way. Okay. And then actually out of D and E, but if you were to save him the trouble and buy the chocolates, that's probably better. But some of you might not have wanted to pick E because you, you just don't want to handle the money in any way. Okay. Top of that, both D and E, ultimately what they lead to is chocolates for the ward staff. All right. Whereas, can you see, if he donates money to the ward, you've probably seen most of you that spent some time on the wards that you'll see a lot of bits of equipment, a lot of the furniture in the relatives rooms, you know, the patient waiting room area will have little plaques on it donated by the patient fund. You know, money that's donated to the ward could be used to buy equipment, furniture that could help other patients, other relatives of patients, other carers, you see, rather than just the net result of DNA is chocolate. The net result of C is something that could potentially benefit a lot more people. OK. And then I said, there's nothing particularly wrong with H, although he's already gone out of his way. Like if someone gave with that a card for you to show that card might be one thing to again, ask him to go out of his way. Um, sorry, for, for you to then go out of your way just to say to your consultant, look, someone said something really good about me. You know, um, do you see it's not anything wrong in it in itself, but Perhaps there's no need for that. OK, whereas if you look at G, one of the things is because he said this to you privately. You see, G is the only one from all these options where you're acknowledging to him that you're not the only one that looked after his mother. On top of that, again, think about one of the domains is working effectively with your team. How would like often what happens? What do we hear about? We hear about complaints. We hear about when things go wrong. How nice would it be if you're a member of the team to hear something positive that, you know, Mrs. Smith's um, son came in. Do you remember she's the lady that we discharged last week? He was saying how happy he was with the way she was looked after. Well, I thought you'd like to know it might boost morale. OK, it might um, it, it might um, sort of, you know, help people sort of get some positive feedback and reinforce it. OK, now there's a real important litmus test that you can do for the multiple choice selection questions, and that is to remember that they have to work together. So read it back together, add in the word and in between and ask, does it make sense? And ask together, does it deal with the situation? So look, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, in alphabetical order, okay? In this case, it probably is. So look, does this make sense, first of all, okay? So just picture it. To the side room, he said how happy he is with the way his mother was looked after and he offers you an envelope with 30 pounds cash. You say, thank you so much for offering me that that's the gesture that's really kind of you but you know i'm not the only one that looked after your mother if you really want to give something why don't you donate the money to the ward it's up to you okay you know everyone looked after your mother then whether he does that or not is his choice you see you've not forced him you've not pressured him you've just made a suggestion that he's already got the money if you really want to do something maybe that would be better rather than giving it to you and then later on can you see this clearly has to be later because none of the staff are in the room with you okay inform the ward staff about his gratitude for the care that his mother's received. OK. Um, and, and so you see now a common reason why some people pick B is they think that A means taking the money and they want don't want to take the money Two, they think that there's something wrong with taking money in this situation. OK, both of those are misconceptions. And that's an example of where knowing the guidance helps. So what does the GMC say about gifts? They say that you can't ask for a gift. You shouldn't um, accept a gift if it's going to be um, something that leads to the patient getting advantageous treatment compared to others. OK. You shouldn't pressure patients or their relatives to donate money. You can see you're suggesting you're not pressuring, even if it's to a good cause. But it also says that if an unsolicited gift is offered, as long as it's not going to be seen as a conflict of interest or taking advantage, it's OK to accept it. You see. You're not even accepting it. Here. You're actually making a suggestion that they could do something that will help other people if they want to. So you're not pressuring them. OK, you didn't ask for them. Can you see his mother's been discharged? You have no duty of care over her anymore. It's not like, for example, if they were still on the ward. 
and you accepted a gift, you might see them more than other patients. They might get favorable treatment. That would be inappropriate. Similarly, let's say that it was a patient who's got dementia offering it to you. That's another example. It'd be seen as a conflict of interest. You know, you're taking advantage. All right? They might not know what they're doing. This is someone that's freely offered it. You see, it's knowing the rules and how to apply it. So a lot of people immediately think, but also look, when you combine them, you say, thank you for offering me that. That's really kind. If you really want to do something, why don't you donate it to the board? He doesn't have to. You've not pressured him. You've not said he has to. And then telling, you've not accepted anything. So it's understanding that you've got to read it together and then knowing the rules on how to apply it. Okay. So marking for these, maximum 12 marks for each one. You get four marks for each bit that you get right. So all three right, 12. Any two right, eight. Any one right, four. You select any, we well, try to select more than three. It, it will just delete the first one. Okay. So part two, to recap, 20 scenarios, each worth 12 marks maximum. So 240 marks. There's three subtypes of this too. So the one that we did is the most common, three most appropriate actions. Then you've got some that will be the three most important considerations. Then the three most appropriate responses to say in a situation, assume they're all said in a polite way. Okay. Again, we'll look at the other two types at the full day SJT course. Right. Now we're going to move on to the last section which is the most important in that it carries half the marks. So part three are ranking questions for each scenario. And there's also the most scenarios here, 37 scenarios. OK, for each scenario, there'll be five options and you rank the option from one to five, one being the best or most appropriate, five being the worst or least appropriate. You can't have any tied ranks. It is possible to leave blank ranks, but don't, because if you do, you're going to get no marks for that bit. And they ask you to rank what a good doctor should do, which isn't always what you would do. Okay. Have a look at this question. Okay, with this one, there's no way for us on a poll to do your whole rating. All I'd like you to do is select which option did you pick as your first? I.e., which one did you rank number one? Okay, just select that. Which one did you rank number one? Okay, great. So there's a big split here in terms of which one people put as their best. Okay, what you can do now is into the chat, put your whole order. Just want to see what kinds of things people have put as their order. So put your whole order. I, if you thought it was first A, second B, third C, fourth D, fifth, you're going to write A, B, C, D. Just write down your whole order, um, you know, into the chat while I have a quick look at the poll. So in terms of poll, the big split in terms of what people put as their first option is B and E. So most of you pick B. Explain to the husband that you have to respect the patient's decision and cannot give blood. Then after that, it was E. Inform the husband that you will contact your consultant for urgent assistance and continue to monitor the patient. So that said, while you're writing into the chat, let me do a quick read back. So you're in obstetrics and gynecology, so women's health, and you see this lady, she's basically given birth, but now having a massive hemorrhage. And she's now become unresponsive, right? she's unconscious. She's still got a pulse though, and she's breathing. Right? She's not in arrest, but she's lost so much blood that she's now unconscious. And you notice from the notes that she's a Jehovah's Witness, and she said that even if my life will be threatened, I don't want blood products. 
and the midwife says that she confirmed that's what she wanted before she became unconscious okay the, the husband's upset he wants you to give her blood you can imagine she's just given birth okay so and the options are a ignore the husband and do nothing so the word ignore and do nothing are important here to me option b explain that's an important word to the husband i got to respect your wife's wishes i can't give her blood option c arrange an urgent blood transfusion because that's the best thing for the patient option d tell the husband rather than explain tell the husband that i can't do anything else and the option e inform the husband that i'm going to get someone senior the consultant the most senior person for urgent assistance and then continue to monitor the patient okay so now the preferred response there's only one order for these questions that will get you full marks okay and so the preferred response is e b d a c now i can see quite a lot of you have got that but as evidence from the poll more of you put b as your first option than put e so a lot of you instead of e b d a c might have put b here e here d a c okay those of you that put b first and e second tell me in the chat what made you put b as the first option the best option ahead of e just trying to think about the thought process it might help others just let me know more of you put b first and e second than the other way so those of you that put b first why did you put b as your first choice just let me know in the chat okay so various people have said different things here let me just try to combine them together and let me know if this is your thought process those of you that put b first and e second did some of you think look she's losing blood right now he's just asked you a question you know i want you to give my wife blood that it's quite quick to explain that i have to respect it and i can't give her blood and then after that to then say look i'm going to get the hold of the boss and get that that's going to take a bit longer and so you thought i'd do b first and then i'd do e is anyone that thought along that line and that's why you put b one and uh, e2 is anyone that thought along those lines that you were thinking about it as the sequence in time that you would do it in chronological order yeah quite a few people so don't worry if you've done that but that is actually the most common reason to lose marks in ranking questions is to think about it as a chronological order no one's asking you which order would you do these in a sequence of time okay and if you think like that you will regularly lose marks in this section which carries the most marks the key word for this section is the word or what they're asking you is if you could only pick one of these which is the most appropriate one to deal with the situation is it e or b or d or a or c not the word then not i do this then this you have to imagine i'm only doing one thing which is the best most complete response it's e why first of all do you remember i mentioned that one of the things is coping with pressure part of that is knowing your your limits does everyone acknowledge that this is far too complex a situation for an f1 to deal with on their own do you see in e you're recognizing your limits that this clearly needs someone senior okay your clinical supervisor your consultant is the most senior person and ultimately part of your job as well thinking about working well as part of a team is to keep the senior members of your team informed about changes to patients like this is life threatening do you see so in e you're recognizing your role as a junior member to tell someone senior you're recognizing this is too complex for you you recognize there's an urgency to getting someone senior but by continue to monitor the patient you can see you can't give blood at the moment they've still got a pulse on their breathing if they go into arrest you could still resuscitate you might be able to do other things do you see e is the most complete response if that's all you're going to do and that's how you got to look at this you got to look at these as this is the whole answer now if that wasn't there and you had to pick from b d a and c you could only do one not as the next thing in a sequence of time as your whole answer b is the next best answer that explaining why you can't give blood is better than just telling them i can't do anything this is a bit more rude they're likely to be more upset this is more polite this shows a negative for empathy and sensitivity okay whereas if you look at a ignoring them and doing nothing you see here you're also not doing anything further but at least you're responding to them even if you're telling them which isn't as good as explaining just ignoring them when they've asked you something that's downright unprofessional isn't it like a is going to get you told off they're likely to complain you would rightly be reprimanded that this is unprofessional for you to ignore someone who asked you something okay whereas look at c c is the worst option and here this is where again knowledge comes into it because quite a few of you put c a bit higher you see 
Option A would get you told off, but option C would get you struck off, potentially. Why? This is knowing the rules. This is what we call an, an advanced directive. This patient has said that even if not getting blood would make my life threatened, I do not want any blood products. You giving them blood would actually be considered an assault. It won't just be unprofessional. That would be considered illegal. So C could get you struck off. On top of that, it's knowing your your, your role that, you know, recognizing something complex like this, for you to go ahead and just organize something like this as an F1, you're going beyond what your limits are. So that's why C is the worst option, okay? It's the outcome, it's the fact that it goes against professionalism, it goes against GMC guidance, and it's actually illegal, all right? It would be considered an assault to give someone a blood transfusion who had said that they do not want blood products, okay? So that's why EBDAC is the best response. Now, this is the most complex marking. It's marked keyed response. Okay, so there's a maximum of 20 marks. That's why it's worth the most, right? There's first of all the most scenarios, 37, but each one's worth 20, whereas each one in section two is only worth 12. In section one, each stem is worth maximum four marks. Okay, um, so 20 marks for the perfect response, i.e. EBDAC. But as long as you rank every option, even the worst order, you'd get eight marks for, which is just under half. And those of you to put BEDAC, Although you've got two wrong and three right, overall it's the second most sensible order. You'd actually get 18 marks out of 20 for that. That's 90%. Whereas, can you see, if you had E at the bottom, C at the top, although you've still got three right and two wrong, you'd get a much lower mark. It's not just how many right and how many wrong. Every possible order has a number of marks keyed to it. That's why it's called keyed response, okay? The closer you are to the best response, the higher your score. But there's only ever one order that gets you full marks. and like. For some questions, not this one, but some of the harder ones, that can be controversial. And this is why it's called situational judgment. There's often a difference of opinions, and that's why there's partial marks, okay? You can get zero marks for one of these questions, and you can get less than eight. The only way to do that is if you leave items unranked. So imagine there was a scenario here, okay? This is how it will actually appear on Pearson View. So the scenario would be here, the answer options are here, and then you have one, two, three, four, five. So if you think that this should be one, you move that here. If you think this is two, you drag that here. Now imagine someone ran out of time and they just didn't have time to move three of these. So you automatically get zero for this bit, zero for this bit, zero for this bit. And overall, you could get a very low mark now, less than eight. Whereas as long as you rank something, you move everything to this side somewhere, even the worst order will get you eight marks, okay? This is why, again, timing is important, that making sure you've given your best shot to every question even if it's not perfect, in a lot of cases, you still get 80, 90% of the marks, even though it's wrong, not perfect. If it's perfect, you get 20, okay? So part three, 37 scenarios, 740 marks, the most important section. There's three subtypes. Ranking the appropriateness of actions is the most common. Ranking the importance of different considerations and ranking the appropriateness of responses to say, okay? Now, key changes in the new format SJT. So the new format came in last year. Before that, this used to be a pencil and paper exam, and there were only two types. So if you see some of the older books, they'll only talk about the pick three from eight and the ranking. Ratings were completely new last year. So key changes in the new format, three sections instead of two. So the rating type questions, part one, completely new since last year. The things to say subtype, which is possible in all three sections, new last year. Evolving scenarios, we haven't done any here, but we'll do them at the full day course. You'll get some where, the first one, for example, let, let's say here, is this. Then you might move on to the next question and you might say part A for reference and it will repeat this and then it'll add another bit, part B. The consultant arrives and they talk to the husband and something I, it evolves the scenario, it adds something else to it, okay? Um, and so that's new, they didn't used to have that type before. That was new last year, okay, evolving scenarios. Before it was pencil and paper, so they couldn't have any multimedia questions. All questions were just text. So last year, there were some video questions. So some will be filmed videos, some will be animated videos, with a short video clip, maybe up to a minute, minute and a bit, okay? Uh, two minutes maximum, and then there'll be a scenario attached to it, okay? So that's new. Again, we'll do examples of that at the full day course. And then something new for this year is that halfway through, 
you can have a 10 minute break if you want to, where it won't count down. Like if you want to use the bathroom, you want to have a bit of a stretch, you can actually pause halfway and then do the second half. Okay. Okay. So some tips for part one, the rating. Read the scenario carefully at the start, i.e. for the first one, because then for the rest of the stems, it's going to be exactly the same. So you don't need to reread it. Think about inappropriate as very inappropriate. It makes it easier. Okay. Map back to the domains. You've got to think about which options, you know, does it show negatives for, um, you know, those five domains we talked about earlier. And remember, every stem in ratings is completely separate. I don't think I've used that one, so I can't use it again. You might use each option once, more than once. Some of them might not apply to any of them. None of them might be somewhat appropriate, for example. You've got to just look at it independently. So, you know, just because this was inappropriate, this is also inappropriate, then select that. Don't think, oh, I've just used that. I have to change it to something else, okay? Tips for part two, remember it's about the three choices combined. Think about the word and, okay? So read it back together. When you add in the word and, does it make sense? If it doesn't, you've got it wrong, change it. And then watch out for pairs or triplets. Sometimes there are things that might be sensible on their own, but would never work together. They won't make sense. So if you pick one from the set, you could eliminate other. I'll give you an example. You see, look, if you suggest he donates some money to the ward, it wouldn't make sense to also take the money and buy chocolates. Or if you suggest he buys chocolates for the ward, it wouldn't make sense for you to also take the money and buy chocolates. So if you've picked this one, you could eliminate some of the others, okay? Similarly, look at this one. It wouldn't make sense to tell him to keep his money and take the money and buy chocolates. It wouldn't make sense together, okay? Whereas when we read these three together, it makes sense, okay? When you add in the word and. And then tip for part three, ranking. Read all the options before you rank, because until you know all of them, you can't compare. Because remember, section three, you're comparing. They're not asking if something's good or bad or right or wrong. They're just asking, is it better or worse? Some hard questions, they'll all be good. Some hard questions, they'll all be bad. But which one's better or worse? So you've got to compare it to the one above and the one below as if it's the only thing you're going to do. Not I do this, then this. It's Is this better or is this better? Is this more appropriate or is this more appropriate? Okay. Consider the potential outcomes, the potential for harm and the potential for benefit. And read the stem carefully. You know, watch out for those new subtypes. Again, considerations of how important things are might be different to appropriateness of actions, might be different to appropriateness of things to say, okay? And then some things to think about for all questions. Sometimes think about the impact of time. There are some things that are time sensitive. Think about who to involve. There are some things that are beyond the limits of an F1. There are some things that an F1 should be able to do on their own. There are some things where you need someone senior, some things where you need someone not much more senior, but a bit more senior than an F1. Think about when it would be appropriate to take a formal versus an informal approach. Think about not just how different options might impact you, but consider patients, other members of the team, your colleagues. Think about lines of authority. Who's the right person to deal with which situation in the team? So you need to understand the roles of different team members. And then you need a really good working knowledge of ethics and good medical practice. Okay. So that brings us on to the core knowledge. As I said, we're not actually going to cover the theory of the core knowledge, we cover that at the full day course, but what some questions where it will help you to know this. So you need to know the biomedical ethical principle. You need to know when you can and can't breach confidentiality and the GMC's guidance on this. You need to understand capacity, including GLIC competence and the Fraser guidelines. You need to understand the new rules on consent and the difference between Montgomery and the BOLAM standard and GMC 2020 guidance on consent. To understand and have a good working knowledge of how to apply GMC duties of a doctor and these key ethical guidance. So safeguarding and child protection, end of life care, the Tracy case, personal beliefs and medical practice, okay? Um, raising concerns, prescribing, maintaining boundaries, social media, financial issues to do with gifts, for example. Do you see how knowing the rules about some of these things could make a difference? So for example, personal beliefs and medical practice that we have a duty to respect patients' ability uh, uh, to you know, apply their own beliefs. Like you might not have an issue with blood, but if the patient doesn't want to have blood, it's their right to say no to it, for example. You know, things like that, it can help, okay? And because the F1 SJT asks what a good doctor should do rather than what you would do necessarily. In some cases, can you see, it's about knowing what does the guidance say? Because some of these, you don't know what you would do. You haven't encountered it. You can't actually prescribe as a student. So you don't know the ins and outs of some of these beyond the theoretical phase at this stage. Um, and so, you know, there are some questions that do test a good working knowledge of key GMC guidance, okay? So it's worth revising all of that core knowledge before the exam. It will help you for some questions. For a lot of questions, it's just mapping back to the domains and understanding the techniques. OK, so I'll look at questions and answers now for the next 10 minutes or so, and then I'm going to do the summary.
Okay. So in terms of how to prepare, you really need to understand not just the overarching five domains and attributes, but each one's got subdomains. Okay. We cover those in detail at the course. You need to have a good working knowledge of good medical practice and to understand all of those core GMC ethical guidance. You need to have a really good understanding between the question types and the response types and how to approach section one questions compared to section two questions compared to section three and within each of them the subtypes there are nine different types and then ultimately you want to practice some questions ideally to time because time is really really important so in terms of useful resources there is one official foundation practice paper online in the new format but it doesn't have sort of like it doesn't give you an idea of a scale and it didn't have answers and explanations for everything okay but there is one full official practice paper on the foundation program website it's worth understanding the subdomains which are listed in the sjt monograph on the gmc website there's a section called good medical practice in action which has animated scenarios and evolving scenarios not in exact format of the sjt but just it gets you thinking about how to apply that guidance in different scenarios and then to read and understand the GMC ethical guidance. OK, and then if you want to cover all of the key things in a really efficient way, and particularly if you found today helpful and maybe have a clearer idea and you think that this type of learning, analyzing things in detail is helpful, then, you know, you might find helpful our full day Foundation SJT course. It's been running for nine years for the Foundation SJT. I since it foundation sjt came about but we've been running it because the first specialties to start using situational judgment tests in medical equipment was gp and then other specialties start using it so some of you after foundation you're going to apply for specialty training if you apply for specialty training in 12 specialties gp psychiatry child and adolescent mental health neurosurgery radiology anesthetics emergency medicine pediatrics obstetrics and gynecology sexual and reproductive health um, you know, various training programs, you'll sit an exam called the multi-specialty recruitment assessment. That's got two papers. One is clinical, one is situational judgment test, but it's a different type of SJT to this, although there's some similarities. We've been teaching for that exam for 14 years now. We were the first people to develop a question bank for it. Okay. So what we will cover in that full day course is all of the key GMC ethical guidance and how to apply it to SJT scenarios made really concise, concise so you can cover it easily. We will cover exam technique, which is really, really important. This exam is not largely knowledge. There is some knowledge that helps for some questions. It's largely technique. So we'll look at the key techniques for all three sections. We will cover all nine SJT question subtypes. We will have a 24 question teaching mock with discussion, detailed analysis of why the right answer is right. And after the course, you'll get access to the recording of the course for a month so that you can watch it back and revise. We also get access to 165 SJTs, including the new ratings type. At the course, we'll also cover examples of video questions. We'll cover examples of all of the subtypes, okay, and how to approach them. We've been running this course and had excellent feedback and results going back nine years, okay. Most years, over 96% of people that get back to us end up with one of their top three choices. And our top score to date, 49.16. I nearly perfect score, okay. So in terms of practice questions, some people that aren't going to attend the course, they just want practice questions. So we do have um, 165 plus. There'll be a slightly more as we get closer to the exam, but there's already 165 plus questions, including all three types. There's rating questions, ranking questions, selection questions. There's a, a mini mock there. All of them have feedback and explanations. That's 25 pounds for two months. But if you attend the course, you get access to that for free. OK, so in terms of the course, We've got two dates, 9th October, we've got limited spaces left now for that one. The other one is 13th November. It will run on Zoom, so it'll be similar format. you do it from home, but we'll use Zoom rather than this software. Um, it's a full day, it's a really long day, 9.30 a.m. to 6 p.m., six hour CPD. It's 99 pounds for a space, and that includes access to the recording and the online questions. If you book as a group of five or more, you can save 15 pounds each, right? it's 84 pounds. And then finally, we are looking for a student rep for each medical school. So a student rep that books, if they post links to the, this video on our YouTube channel once it's ready, an article that I've written about SJT and sort of you know post on social media about their experience of the course after they've been to it, um, then after the course, once we've seen those things, you can get a 50% refund 
of the fee that you pay to attend the course. Okay, so one of my colleagues will post a link for those that might be interested to join that program. Okay, questions that people have asked. Um, so someone's asked that are video questions for practice available on the SJT mock exam paper? Yes, on the official mock, there is a an example of a, a couple of video questions. Okay. Um, Someone said, in the ratings question that involves speech, do you imagine it as the only thing that is said or something you might say as part of a larger response? So you just imagine that as just imagine that bit. It doesn't mean that's all you're going to do. You might later add something to it. But just looking at that bit, is that bit appropriate, somewhat appropriate, somewhat inappropriate, inappropriate. OK, and so on. OK, so you just look at that bit on its own, but it doesn't have to address the whole situation. There might be other things that you might do later, but just that bit on its own, is it appropriate down to very inappropriate? Okay. Someone said, generally speaking, what differentiates very appropriate from somewhat appropriate? So very appropriate will basically be only positives or almost exclusively positives. Somewhat appropriate will have some negatives, but mostly positives, a lot more positives than negatives. Somewhat inappropriate might have some positives, but will have a lot more negatives than positives and inappropriate Think about that as very inappropriate. It'll basically be either entirely negative or overwhelmingly negative. Okay. Someone asked is if part three has the most marks, would you recommend doing that first? No, that would be a disaster. Why? The exam is linear. What do I mean by that? It starts with section one. And in order for you to go beyond section one, you'd have to click next. So in section one, remember, there's like 114 stems. So you have to click 114 times next 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 just to get to section two okay then you'd have to click next 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 to all 20 of those scenarios to get to section three some questions have a video a video question when it comes on you can't forward it you have to watch the whole thing before you can click next so you'd waste probably 20 30 minutes just to get to section three then you'd have to click previous 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 a hundred and something times to get back to section one Approaching it in that way, you almost certainly wouldn't finish the paper. It's really tight for time, and that would lead to a really disastrous mark. Probably end up with that bottom half a percent. Okay. Start at the beginning, work your way forward. Be conscious of time. Okay. Someone said, How long should we spend on study? So because it's not a knowledge-based exam, it's not like finals where you might spend months because there's a big curriculum, right? If you come to the full day course, you can cover all the key theory in that day. You can get exposed to all the techniques. After that, you know, go through all the questions, go through the official example questions. We'll send you some more old official examples, okay, with answers and explanations. That's enough. So you could do it in a, a few weeks, okay? You can, you know, for this, you can actually spend too long and overthink things, all right? Um, someone said, does the course cover all the key theory uh, from, the ethical guidance of good medical practice. Yes, we will cover all of these bits that we talked about here, this core knowledge, all of these ethical guidance and all of these things we will cover in detail, okay? Um, and how to apply it, okay? So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do the summary now because come to 9.30, I can see a few more questions. I will come back and answer those because that way anyone that hasn't got questions, I don't wanna keep you too long so that you can finish on time because it's already 9.30 now and we're due to finish this. So let me just do the summary. It's only gonna take me a few minutes, okay? So to summarize, look, the SJT is a really important factor in your ranking. In some cases, actually slightly more important than your EPM. Having a good working knowledge of that core ethical guidance and GMC guidance is really helpful for some questions. What's essential though, is to understand the FY1 attributes, the domains, the subdomains, and how to approach them. Similarly, the different techniques to approach each section is really, really important, okay? Um, exam technique and timing is the key to high scores. And then practice and preparation can help to optimize your performance so that on the day, you've got the best chance of showing your best self, okay? Of getting the best score possible, all right? Um, I leave you with this, adapted from Abraham Lincoln, I attributed to him that, you know, if you have six hours to chop down a tree, you do well to spend four hours sharpening your axe. I, if you prepare well at the beginning, when you actually get to the task, it's going to be easy. You'll slice through it like butter. Okay. And so, you know, like anything in life, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. But the opposite is true. And it's actually our tagline at eMedica that prepare and you will succeed. Okay. So, you know, huge thank you to everyone for giving up part of the evening to join. I hope you found it helpful. 
huge thank you to the eMedica team for helping to answer questions and dealing with things in the chat, okay? Whether you attend the full day course or not, I hope you found today helpful. I hope maybe some of the myths about the SJT are dispelled. I hope you've got a clearer idea of what it is, what it's testing and how to approach it. And myself and the whole team wishes you every success with your SJT. Prepare and you will succeed. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.